Thanks for joining us this morning, everyone. Um, those of you who stuck around and any new faces that we have, uh, just a reminder to click on the link I just put in the chat um, to be entered to win some door prizes. We'll be doing those drawings um, tomorrow. So um, be sure to fill out that quick survey to be entered um, in that. And I will turn it over to Dr. Locke, and whenever she's ready to get started. All right, um, it is 10 o'clock, and yesterday I went over my time a little bit, so I'm gonna start right now at 10 o'clock, and if anyone joins us, we will welcome them in. And so welcome to each of you for being here this morning um, for this volunteer training session, um, volunteers, extension agents, whatever role you're playing. Um, you're doing a significant contribution because you're um, providing leadership for our 4-H program. Um, our, pro our topic today is the big M, and hopefully um, when we finish today, you will be able to employ some of these techniques as you plan your 4-H club meetings, uh, projects, activities, um, and you know, as with everything we're doing right now, this presentation is really done much better in person with a lot of hands-on activities and so I'm going to try to do some hands-on activities today but mind you I grew up on a TRS AV computer back in the early 80s and I'm trying to adopt some of these new technologies so I have some backup plans if it doesn't work but um, if you will we'll just get started so um Quick introduction, um, my name is Darlene Locke. I am an assistant professor and extension specialist, and I'm a product of the 4-H program. I think it is one of the best things that we can offer for our youth, um, but I also think it's something that our families genuinely appreciate and um, gain a lot from, which probably explains why you're on this session this morning, so you probably have those same ideas. I've had the um, huge benefit of, of uh, as I said, being a 4-H member in Montgomery County, uh, but then also serving as a county extension agent on the front line, working directly with youth and families, and then went on to be a district and state specialist where I kind of work more with the agents that are delivering the program. I think one of my greatest senses of understanding how our 4-H members progress through the program was when I was at the 4-H Center as a program director and a director. And I got to see the growth in young people through camping opportunities and also the leadership that members had when they came back um, with their district leadership labs. And, and I'm not giving you all of this as a way to say, you know, what I've done, but to, it aligns perfectly with this whole idea of the big M. Um, and so just to kind of set the stage for that. So, um, all right, so here's first, my presentation is not wanting to advance, so just hang on. We will get this figured out, even if we have to. Okay, and stop sharing and see if I can, it's frozen. Okay, I'm not sure what's up with that. We did this yesterday. I okay. think you might have had the annotation. Um, oh selected so it wasn't allowing you to click maybe okay that could be it okay well we're going to go back to this okay let's make sure i have that annotation bar turned off now okay all right so um you should see on the screen what i need you to do is do a little housekeeping so that we can have um, some interactivity. So if you will, uh, if you have your smartphone handy, you're going to send a text message and the address or the two is this 37607. So that'll be the number you put up there that you're gonna send it to. And then your message is just as it has there, Darlene Lock 260. I'm gonna give you all a second to do that. If y'all have any questions, thankfully, it sounds like Callie's still on. And so between she and I, if you're putting questions in the chat, we can see those. 
Okay, you might receive a message back immediately saying you have now joined Darlene Locke's session. Um, and we're gonna use that here in just a moment to see if it actually works. So the first thing I wanna do is just try to get an idea and try to get your engagement in this. So what I'd like for you to do is from where you just registered, I want you to answer the question, why are you involved in the 4-H program? Okay, and what you'll do is you'll just type that word into your message and send it. Okay, I have somebody that put in CEA. So y'all, and um, I will show you the screen also, so you can see these words as they come in. We're giving everybody a few minutes to, to input their words. I've only got one response so far. You can even do it on your computer screen if you don't want to do it on your phone. Can you all see the screen? There we go. Now we're getting some words in. So what it's going to do is each of you type in your message. Your message should appear on the screen. Callie, can you see? Yes, ma'am. We can see. Okay, good. And the way this works, it's creating a word cloud. And if you type in the same word that someone else does, then that word is going to grow. So it looks like we've got a lot of agents on this morning because you can see CEA, County Extension Agent, uh, in very large font. That's not because they're more important, it's just that there's several of them have used that same word. So this is just an idea. So we've got parent, we have responsibility, opportunities. I really want you to be thinking, why are you as an adult involved in 4-H? Educational, future, gener future generation probably was um, together. Maybe child's opportunities was one, uh, it takes it one word at a time, unless you do like someone did grow slash learn, then that'll keep it together. So we probably all have some of the same reasons for being a part of the program. Um, we all know that 4-H is a family program um, with emphasis on youth development. And um, so I'll let y'all keep doing that for a little bit and we'll get back to our screen here. Did you know, and so my role now is more about doing research on 4-H programs and activities. We really need to quantify to our stakeholders and to our families even, as we're trying to get new families involved, of why they should be in 4-H versus some other activity. And so we know that 4-Hers are four times more likely to give back to their communities. We know that they are two times more likely to make healthier choices. We also know that they're two times more likely to participate in STEM activities. We know these facts because of the study of positive youth development um, by Dr. Richard Lerner and colleagues at Tufts University. This study started in 2002, at which time I was still an extension agent, um, and it followed youth that were currently in the fifth grade in 2002 until they graduated in 2011. There were over 7,000 youth that contributed to this study. So it's a, it's a pretty large um, survey uh, sample size. And what Dr. Lerner proposed, and he was funded partly by National 4-H Council to do this study, was that when the strengths of youth are aligned across adolescents, across their growth with their family, their school and community resources, that positive youth development would occur. What they were specifically looking at were these five out of school time programs. 4-H, Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, YMCA, and Scouting. And so the idea was to find out if any one of these programs did better at producing the outcomes he was looking for of positive youth development. And so these are called the five C's. Hopefully, you all have at least heard of the five C's. You may not be able to, you know, list them without some help. Sometimes I even have to go back and find them. But I think we could all say that through our 4-H program, youth gain competence in knowledge and skills. They develop confidence. Oh, I was such this shy child. 
when I was in 4-H, but I grew and I, I'm sure we can all attest to that same um, scenario. And then the other three, character, connection, and caring. So those are the five C's of positive youth development. And he further theorized that if you were able to express these five C's, then a sixth C contribution would um, be the ultimate result. And I, I know that our 4-H members contribute, okay? So put us back to our big M. Um, the big M are eight essential elements that were identified in youth um, through this study. And that if the eight essential elements were met, and you can see them numbered here, one through eight, if those essential elements are met, then those youth are more likely to thrive and to become independent and contributing members of society, which is exactly what we want. So um, I'm not gonna read these eight to you because we're gonna go through them in a moment, um, but this is how we structure our 4-H program. You may not be aware of that, and I would, have, I would testify that many of you are doing these things, but you may not have ever said, I have a positive relationship with a caring adult, or you are the caring adult that has a positive relationship. And you know, the, the important thing is, is that when we structure our 4-H club meetings, our 4-H club activities and projects, we should look to these eight elements as we plan the activities, um, because scientifically based, I mean, this will happen. So, um, as I said, we're gonna go through each of them. Let me back up just a second. So the big M, the eight essential elements are grouped into four general concepts, okay? And the elements are distributed among those four. And you can see there's not two in each one. The uh, essential element one, three are grouped into what's called belonging. And everyone wants to belong to something. And we would much rather them belong to a positive organization than um, something that's less positive independence. That's a huge um, issue for our young people as they are developing. They want to become independent and be able to do things on their own and to have some sense of control. The next one is generosity, which I personally think the 4-H program does an outstanding um, effort with to get our youth to value and practice service for others. You know, I don't think there's anything we do that does not have a component of service in it. And I, I just think that's one of our um, foundational aspects of the 4-H program that allows our young people to prosper. And then lastly, mastery. And that's where, yes, our youth want to learn things and they want to become better at something, but when they really, really mature is when they are able to become the teachers themselves and to share what they know with their peers and with others. And so the big M, belonging, independence, generosity, and mastery. None of these have more prevalence over the other. And they're just grouped into these four categories as a way to make it more digestible. Excuse me. So we're gonna start off with belonging, <clears throat> excuse me. And if you'll recall, there are three different essential elements that are part of belonging. So belonging is when one of those elements is that you have a positive relationship with a caring adult. We know that not all youth have a, an adult in their lives, uh, in the family uh, maybe, that provides that positive experience for them. So through 4-H and other organizations, you know, they can have this relationship with an adult that they can rely on that will listen to them, um, that's with them throughout an experience, um, and that, that this adult really genuinely cares about the young person. So when we think of our 4-H programs, uh, for each of these, we're gonna talk about some strategies and ideas that you may want to incorporate. Ratio of adults to youth low, uh, keeping that ratio low having adults that are actively engaged and combining structured time and informal time. These are ways that youth can appreciate that adult without feeling that the adult is driving everything. If you have some structured 
as well as some informal time. All right, so here's our second opportunity to see if we can do some interaction. We're gonna go back to our poll now. And what I would ask you to do is name one thing, and, and this will be anonymous. No one will know what you contribute, okay? So be honest and think about what is one thing that you do that makes you a caring adult? There's a couple examples there for you. Okay, so this can be more of like a phrase. But let's just see out there, you guys are on the front line, you're interacting with youth in clubs and projects. So what are some things that you do that you do as a caring adult? So you're gonna, you can do this from your phone. Um, let's see if that works. I'm going to do a test. Of course, it's easy. All right. Okay, are we? Oh, wouldn't you know it? Now it's switched over. Hmm. Okay. So it looks like my um, little online system here is requiring a, I got someone, you're gonna have to enter it off of your um, PC or your Mac or whatever it is. So we've got some coming in. Volunteer and serve my community, teach. I like that one that I make on pack to show that I care and I'm listening. Pushing them to be better. We'll leave it up for about 15 more seconds if anyone else wants to contribute. And I, you can also, um, if, if this poll system doesn't work, you can put it over in the chat. And the reason I want you to do this is because it encourages each of us, you know, to know what other people are doing. So there's several of you that are contributing in the chat area. And so that works as well. All right, good deal. So as a, as a kind of a wrap up on this idea of having a positive relationship with a caring adult, in the essential elements training that is available, um, that this comes from, that does have a lot of these hands-on activities, there's actually a quiz in there that you could take for yourself and for your club. And questions you would ask is, do I expect members to treat each other with respect? Do I encourage all of our members? Do we set reasonable guidelines? And do I give my members full attention when they talk to me? And one of you contributed that through the poll. So as you set up your club meetings, um, you know, a place where sometimes we have a little conflict might be that you have additional individuals that are there at your club meeting that kind of sit in the back of the room and distract. And so as the caring adult role that you have as a club manager, or leader, or agent, you know, it's, it's important that that little group of, of folks in the back are either engaged in the meeting that you're having or that they're politely asked, maybe they should go outside and, and continue their conversation. But it's important that the members feel that the space they're in is for them and that the attention is for them. So, you know, one thing you can do as a caring adult is to try to uh, dis disperse any other kind of um, interruptions. Okay, um, our next essential element is having a safe emotional and physical environment. This is so very important um, for young people um, coming from all different walks of life, all different interests that they have. Um, in our 4-H program, we want to serve all youth, and we want youth to not only be served, but feel like they are welcome in our program. And so it's really important that we have um, provisions in place so that every young person and the adults that are involved feel like it's a place where they can express their ideas without being judged, without um, creating some sort of conflict because maybe they have a different idea than another person has. We want to be respectful and provide that place where 
there can be interaction and that people can feel um, that, that, that their ideas are welcome. So you can see on the, the screen there um, some aspects of providing a safe emotional and physical environment. You definitely want to ensure that you have uh, specific measures of risk management in place for your club meetings and your project activities. Um, you know, you want to have the proper number of chaperones, even in a day activity. You want to make sure that as an adult, um, you know, you're never alone, alone with kids. You have other adults there and you have uh, other children there. If you're going to be performing some sort of a new activity, you know, do you provide a demonstration so that the, the young people know um, how to do the activity and what's expected of them? So again, um, some specific ways to do that is to ensure that all participants are allowed to share their thoughts and ideas. Um, I already mentioned the one about not being alone with kids as an adult, not being alone. And, you know, we know that there's going to be negative behavior sometimes in our settings, and there needs to be a way to empower those young people to self-regulate their negative behaviors. So, um, one of the ways that you can set up a safe environment, of course, is for the youth to help come up with the rules that they're going to use for that activity um, and let the youth create ideas of how they expect one another to behave. And um, one of the activities that you can do in the essential elements training is again to take this quiz to find out if your club um, is meeting those objectives. Okay, so one way to ensure that there's a safe environment is does the group have clear and consistent rules and expectations for positive behavior? You can just think about that question. You don't necessarily have to go anywhere and answer it. Um, another one is are all of the adults working with our group familiar with youth protection policy? I get to um, review all of the overnight 4-H activities that happen across the state as our extension agents and volunteers are completing all the necessary steps for risk management. It's really important that our adults are familiar with our policies and that they are also enforcing those policies with all of the adults around them. It's, it's critically important that we have the safe environment for our uh, families and our youth to participate. Okay. Another question you can ask yourself or your club is, do you allow offensive language or gestures at your meetings and functions? And you know, stuff like that's going to happen. Um, but do you have a measure that you can correct that um, from happening and prevent it from happening again? So it's just important that, that it's a respectful place and that all are treated equally and fairly and justly. And then the last one for this session, or section, this element, would be when you do have conflicts, does your group deal with those conflicts as they arise? Do you address them? Do you um, do kind of a, okay, step back, let's see what happened, um, and let's put measures in place to prevent this from happening again. And so those are um, ideas on safe emotional and physical environment. It's really easy a lot of times to make sure we have a physical environment that's safe. You know, if we're doing an activity that involves cutting, you know, are the young people prepared to use scissors correctly? You know, maybe you're using a hot glue gun, um, but it's often much more difficult to identify those emotional things that you want to be looking at. And so here's just a kind of a summary of some really important aspects of providing a safe and emotional and physical environment. Okay. Inclusive environment. And um, I, would, I would just tell you, you know, when I think of inclusive, I think of all kids. And I don't, you know, I don't think of, you know, in 4-H, we want to include all youth. Um, and we look past colors and ethnicities and those kind of things. We have to consider our inclusive environment in 4-H 
goes well beyond ethnicities and race and color. We have families that come from the urban populations, the rural populations, the suburban populations, and, and those are very diverse um, audiences. We have young people that come from um, public schools, private schools, charter schools, home schools. And again, that's a whole nother set of diversity. And so when we say the environment is inclusive, you don't, don't stigmatize that into just thinking about race and ethnicity. We have members in our 4-H program with varying uh, learning abilities and maybe have some youth with disabilities. And so, um, you know, there's just lots of things we can do to encourage all youth to be involved in our 4-H program. Will we have to make some accommodations? Absolutely. Um, but if those accommodations are reasonable, you know, then we should do it so that those, so that every kid has the same opportunity um, that another youth would have. So these are some ideas about uh, creating an inclusive environment. Team building activities will always be a great way to do that, but there needs to be proper facilitation of those activities so that, um, especially if it's a problem solving type activity, there can get some real heated discussions and there may be a need for that caring adult, adult to step in and kind of intervene and make sure everybody is being inclusive, but everybody's being respectful, we're following the rules, and it all kind of stacks up together. Creating an inclusive environment um, might be where you celebrate all types of occasions and all types of accomplishments, not necessarily just those kids that win first place are not necessarily just those kids that get elected to an office position. There's other ways to celebrate um, accomplishments. I think we do a good job with branding and um, using the 4-H Clover as our kind of um, identifier. And it's, uh, you know, kids feel that sense of belonging when they're part of a group. And when that group has some sort of a label, like the 4-H Clover, um, you know, that just, kind of creates this sense of I'm part of that group. And again, we definitely want them to be part of that group versus another group. So um, here are some program strategies that as you're doing your club meetings or your project activities, definitely, you know, you want to make sure that you're using some sorts of get acquainted activities. Even if all the kids already know one another, they all grew up in the same town. So, you know, we don't have to do get acquainted. Wrong. They don't know everything about every youth within their group. And so a get acquainted activity is a really good way for them to kind of um, break the ice and, you know, open up about themselves. And we might learn that even though people live next door to one another, that there's many similarities between them, but there's also uh, many differences between them. And so it's, it's just um, don't think that because all of your kids in your foods and nutrition club all come from the same neighborhood. They've all lived together. You know, don't discount using get acquainted activities. This is a great way to just kind of interact with one another. Um, using a youth name, of course, is very important. I mean, we all want to be recognized by our name and not just, hey, you or whatever. And so most times we do know um, the youth in our program. But as you gain new members, you want to definitely make an effort to learn who they are. And then we've talked about recognizing individual members for actions or accomplishments. So if you were, and I'm not going to do this on every one, so don't panic. Um, I think this is the last one we're going to try to look at it this way. But if you were to take that quiz, then ask yourself these questions. Do we use icebreakers at the beginnings of activities or meetings in order to get everyone involved? And y'all can just answer that to yourselves. And if you need um, some games or activities to use, in my previous life as a director of the 4-H Center, I have many resources that I would be very happy to share with you. Um, and I'll, you'll have my contact at the end of the presentation. The next question you might ask yourself to know that you have an inclusive environment is that do, does every member feel that their opinion is valued? 
You know, do you give the opportunity for the one young person that just thinks, oh my goodness, this is not what I want to do. Even though everybody else wants to do it, you know, do you allow that one young person to say, hey, I think we need to do this instead. And, and, and allows them to voice that different opinion. You know, um, the hardest part about being in 4-H for new families, I think, is just getting over that, that hump of learning the language, learning how to be a part of the group. And sometimes in our rapid uh, pace, we don't always do a good job with that, uh, including new faces right away so that they feel like they're part of the group. And so maybe in your club, you have a committee or a task force that um, as you gain new members, it's their job to make sure that that young new person or that new family understands how they can get involved and what does it mean to get involved and what is a food challenge? You know, we've got language that people don't, you know, don't necessarily know. Um, and so having a group dedicated for that can be very helpful in this effort to ensure that people are immediately included in the program. Do we discourage new ideas if we say things like, that'll never work, we tried that before? You know, sometimes it may be something that you tried before, but if a new person comes in and suggests it, and we give them the opportunity to explain what they're thinking, they could actually be thinking of it in a completely different way, even though it looks on the surface like the same thing we've been doing all this time. So um, to be inclusive, when people have ideas, you know, we want to make sure that they're heard out and that if there's an opportunity to test their idea that we do and that we don't just say, nah, we've been there, done that. Okay. So um, I think there's maybe one. That's it. All right. So, um, oh, and look, there's our word cloud that we completed on the first step. Um, scholarships, wow, congratulations to all the youth that were recognized last night for our scholarship program. All right, all right, so moving right along. So we, again, here's a summation. I think we've talked about those enough. All right, we're moving on. So that was our three essential elements about belonging. Belonging is so important to kids. They have to belong to something. So in 4-H, let's make sure we're making all you feel like they're a part of our program. The next one is independence. While they want to be a part of a group, they want to be independent, okay? And so under the independence grouping, there's two ones, that, two um, essential elements that we'll talk about. And the first one is being able to see ourselves as an active participant in the future. So you can see um, what's the future going to look like, what skills or behaviors do our youth need in order to get there. So um, in our projects especially, we want to make sure that youth understand how to set goals. And not only set goals, but what steps do they have to take to reach those goals. Um, I can remember back when I was a kid, you know, that's the first thing we had to do for our food and nutrition project or my sheet project, I had to list the goals that I wanted to attain in that year. And so I hope that we're still doing that and that we're encouraging you to set goals and then to set realistic goals. Um, we want them to think about their future and how their 4-H projects are gonna help them get to being a civil engineer or the world's best chef or you know whatever it is that they have in mind that they want to do, you know, there's lots of things in our projects that can directly build towards that goal. And then very definitely, we want to make sure that our young people have the opportunity for future leadership opportunities. Not just while they're in 4-H, but once they graduate 4-H and they're out in the, the real world, we want to make sure that they feel that confidence to take on leadership roles. So, um, if you were examining your club or your project, these are some questions you would ask. And these, this is how you would evaluate your program to know if you're providing this sense of independence. Um, 
you know, do, do they feel like they'll be able to take on an active role in future events? Okay, and you can see those, um, taking on leadership roles as an adult. Um, so that one is pretty clear. It's mostly about setting goals, but also um, helping them to see beyond just their time in 4-H. How does this, what we're doing today in the shooting sports project apply to my work, my life 20 years from now? You know, you know, we hear kids all the time say they don't want to do their record books. Um, and we know that as adults, we encourage them to do record books because it's more than keeping a record of what they've done. It's developing that skill of writing things down and keeping a historical record of what you've done in order to get from A to B to C. And so, but, you know, um, those are some things about opportunity to see oneself in the future. So now as we go to our second element of the independence is this opportunity for self-determination and it builds on the goal setting also. You'll see a lot of overlap. But again, um, self-determination means that I can make a plan and I can set a goal, I can make a plan and I can do the steps that are required to get to that end result. And so in our projects, again, we just really want to be intentional with our young people that it's important to actually write down your goal for this project or this activity, even if they're just planning like a some sort of holiday celebration and it's a committee of kids, you know, they want to write down what do they hope to accomplish by having this celebration and then what are they going to do to have the celebration? How are they going to evaluate it? So all of these things are about self-determination and letting kids take on responsibilities, real responsibilities, and being able to carry it out. So questions we ask ourselves are, are the members involved in making rules and setting policy? You know, we're more likely to follow rules if we've had a hand in creating them. Um, are the members setting the goals for the group? And, and determining you know, what the club is gonna do. You really wanna make sure that not only the officers in your clubs or your project groups have leadership and have some sense of having, um, being able to make decisions, but all members should have a part in making decisions. So um, opportunity for self-determination is when we allow our, our youth to plan conduct, and then evaluate their programs and activities. Now, so that's that we've got the B and the I, we're on to G, generosity. And there's only one essential element under generosity, and that is opportunity to value and practice service to others. Again, I think this is something that we excel in, but we wanna make sure we're doing it for the right reasons and that the youth understand the role that they're playing um, not only to help a community, but to help a community move forward, okay? Um, so with that, we also want to make sure that, you know, it's not always top down where the adult leaders in the club come up with the ideas for the projects and activities uh, for service. We want to, you know, make sure that the youth are recognizing the issues or the needs in their own community and they're coming up with solutions. Because very often, they, they might have the same solution you would offer, but very often they might have a different solution from their perspective as a young person. And so, you know, again, it's, it's they're creating the service activity, which also goes back to them having the independence to create that. So again, these all kind of tie together and overlap. Um, but we do definitely want to make sure our youth are planning and conducting the project and that they're sharing ideas that help the community, but also ideas that improve, improve their own club structure. Um, I've already talked about that, making sure that the youth are aware of their community and what's needed in the community, that they see how what they do would benefit the community. And then Wherever you can, you know, if there's ways we can tie service activities to our actual 4-H project work, 
that just helps it be more relative um, and more um, real for the kids. And so <clears throat> Food and Nutrition Project um, conducts a food drive, delivers the food to families in need, delivers it to the food bank, whatever. Um, but actually tying it to their service, their service to their 4-H project work. So in our evaluation of our clubs and activities and projects, these are some questions that you would ask and see how your club is doing. And if you're answering on the shorter end, then there's ways to improve it. Okay. And this, we'll send this out. You all can have it um, to refer back to. Not that it's rocket science or anything, but it is a way that we can ensure that our kids are getting these essential elements so that their end result is that contributing young person. Um, two essential elements in the, in the mastery concept. And this one is the one that I think we really do also an excellent job with, with some of our youth, but we have some areas to grow um, that we could still improve in this area. So engagement in learning. Okay, are the young people involved in learning because it's something that they're interested in and that they want to learn about and how much of it is driven by either the parental influence or the adult leader influence. We would just wanna make sure that we have a balance, that if kids want to learn about astronomy, then we you know, create that learning environment for them. We also want them to take learning and extend it beyond maybe just the club experience. And maybe they extended beyond that to a community learning experience where they invite other youth in and they are sharing their experience with others. So they're actively engaged. The 4-H program is built on the idea of experiential learning, hands-on learning. And um, our hands to do better service, our hands for better living, all of those things are creating that hands-on learning environment that encourages true engagement. So when you look at your club, your activity, um, are the youth leading it? Do they have ownership? Do, they, do you take time to relate what is learned to real life experiences? And especially, are you relating those real life experiences to future careers or future um, educational studies? Because that's really important for kids to see how, you know, in the food challenge, yes, we're learning how to create a recipe, but they're learning about food safety that's going to stay with them their entire life. They're learning about nutrition, you know, um, but we want to help kids see that this is not just so that you can earn a ribbon at the, at the show, okay? Um, and then we know that we have levels of involvement, and do we value a young person that only chooses to do a county level of involvement versus a young person that goes all the way to the state level of involvement? Um, families have different resources available to them, and so we want to be sure that if a family or a child is only able to do certain things, that, that we encourage them and we celebrate them for that engagement to whatever level they are able to do. Okay? Um, and the final eighth essential element that falls under mastery, again, they're just in this order because it's easy to remember big M, but opportunity for mastery is where we allow our young people, or we encourage our young people to go from just being the learner to being the teacher or the uh, educator or the advocate or whatever that looks like. But um, we know that our kids thrive on that. Um, when I was at the 4-H Center and we created Mission Possible where young people were um, invited to come in as mentors to help youth with different abilities, it was so, so, um, rewarding to see our 4-H youth take on that role of teaching one-on-one -on -one to someone else something that they knew how to do. Another is like our junior leadership retreat where the Texas 4-H council members, that weekend at the 4-H center, the only people teaching anything are youth and it's our Texas council youth teaching youth that are in the um, lower grades, the third grade through the ninth grade. My words are escaping, junior and intermediate, okay? 
but we're giving them that chance to now be the educator. A lot of our ambassador programs do that very well. Um, as an ambassador in the livestock or the equine group, those youth are out there speaking to legislators, they're speaking to people in grocery stores, and they're telling you know, what they've learned through 4-H to not only their peers, but also to adults. And when a young person has that chance, that is like a sense of huge accomplishment. Um, so opportunity for mastery is something that we should strive for in all of our projects. And that we should be, as it says in that first one, intentional to provide a, to provide a variety of learning experiences and to take those kids from just the basics up to advanced skills. So, um, you know, I'm sure all of you can uh, think of an example where you've seen young people be the educator, be the one speaking, um, being the advocate um, on a tour uh, in Europe that we were on with 4-H. I saw a young man in the most uh, polite way um, dispel someone's thoughts about production agriculture. He was very articulate, the young man was, the young 4-H member was. He strongly disagreed with what this adult in Europe was saying about production agriculture. He was very, the 4-H member was very confident as he presented his case. And it just, it was like, it was just, it was wonderful to hear a young person, he was probably 15 or 16 years old, be able to articulate from his viewpoint, the benefits and the disadvantages of that in a very polite and respectful way to an adult. And so um, that was an absolute demonstration of a young person that has reached a mastery level in agricultural understanding. So, um, you know, every youth should have that opportunity. And even if they're not a formal ambassador or they're not on the Texas 4-H Council, um, we should be finding ways in our own communities for those youth to demonstrate their mastery, to go out and to teach others and to share what they have learned. Um, in our GLOBE program that focuses on poverty and cultural understanding, um, one of the requirements for the youth in that program is they have to give presentations to um, two groups in their community, and then they organize a service project around those topics. And so it is just, um, again, we do a good job with that, um, but we, we also have to think about that sometimes that level of mastery might be more viewed as that you have to get to those elected positions or those you know, big name positions like being an ambassador or being a Texas Branch Council member. Every youth can demonstrate mastery um, you know, if we make an effort to include that as part of our programming with that group. So just a real quick run through of the four groupings to remind you of the eight essential elements within them. So we have belonging, positive relationship with a caring adult, lots of ways you guys are already doing that. Um, providing a safe environment, both physically, emotionally, and in providing an inclusive environment. And again, don't think of color, don't think of race. Think of all the things that make up the kids that you work with, um, all the various diversities that they bring. Some kids like to compete, some don't. You know, that's a diversity that we need to to understand and to include in our programming. Independence is our second one, and this is where a young person sees themselves actively participating in the future, and that they have self-determination, that they have some sense of power or, or sense that they have some control over what's happening, not only to them, but to the group that they're a part of. Generosity, opportunity to value and practice service for others, Good job on this, let's keep doing it, let's make sure we're intentional and that our young people understand that we're not just, you know, we're not helping others, we're helping ourselves to understand the situation in our community and what we can do to help 
bring about a difference, okay? And then the last one is mastery. Uh, in our projects, we wanna make sure that there's multiple ways that kids can be engaged in learning. They all come with different learning styles, learning preferences, and so it's good that we can provide um, different uh, types of learning experiences and that, that we give them the opportunity to demonstrate what they know, okay? So that is the big M. And I know it's kind of a boring uh, lecture to you type thing, but um, I hope you get something out of it and I hope that you see the application for your clubs and your um, projects. And, you know, if, um, if you all in your counties or districts, you know, want more information on essential elements and more of a hands-on approach to it on how we can actually design programs, you know, um, there's, you all can do the training, we can come do training, your district specialist can do trainings about this, but sometimes we just kind of roll and do the same things over and over again, and then sometimes we need to stop and reflect and say, okay, are we really doing our best job? And my personal thought is our best job is when we have those eight essential elements as part of our program. So, um, any questions y'all have? Comments? Floor is open for the next uh, five minutes. And um, I'm not sure about the recordings. They are recording, um, but I will get my roster that Mrs. Barrett uh, provided, and I will send each of you this presentation. And it has, um, if you'll look at it from a note form, you'll see all the notes at the bottom. Um, 